continue tonight our thoughts from the 23rd Psalm. And let me say to you that if you have your notes with you that were in the bulletin this morning, every one of the 17 points is in and of itself a sermon. You can take each one of those points and develop the, the sub-points that are under them to the point where you could have a series of 17 lessons. Because this, the 23rd Psalm is just so deep. It's just so rich in the meanings if we would just dig into it and try to understand what David is saying. I understand that when David writes the psalm, that he is in maybe what you and I might consider to be a, a, a dire straits. Remember, he's on the run. Saul is after him, wanting to kill him because Saul has perceived him to be a threat. But David has the presence of mind to realize what's most important. And that is from the first statement of the passage, the Lord is my shepherd. From the very beginning of the 23rd Psalm, David sets the tone saying, it's not about me. It's about what God does for me. And brethren, that's the message and that's the lessons that we need to pull from this passage. So if you have your outline with you, we will start with point number six tonight. If you don't have one, if you didn't get one, a bulletin, uh, we'll have those available a few next week because I can assure you tonight that I will not finish this lesson. I can say that with great confidence. So we will finish it next Sunday morning. Now, whether it's six points or seven points, that'll be, uh, that'll be the, uh, the debate that we have. But if you go back, and if you will, just turn to the 23rd Psalm as we've been breaking it down verse by verse. As we see the fact that it says in verse 3 in the second phrase, He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Brethren, that's guidance. That is God's plan, is to guide us in our way. Again, if you go back over and you look at what the New Testament says about this passage, you go back to John chapter 10. And specifically there, Jesus has said, I am the good shepherd. But specifically look there in verse 3 and verse 4. In verse 3 and verse 4, it talks about the one who is at the door of the sheepfold. Now, before I go much further into that, let me explain something. If you don't understand the ancient times and how a sheepfold worked. It was not a place that one particular shepherd would take one flock. It would be a place that was an area where maybe four or five or even more shepherds would bring their flocks in. And so the sheep that were there intermingled with each other. And so, you, you know, it wasn't that Chip's flock stayed over here at this corner and Seth's flock stayed over here at this corner and Brother Joe's flock stood in another corner and Brother Carlton's was in another corner. When they went in, they got all mixed up. And so when you see that it says he leads me to righteousness, the guidance, the implication of the shepherd there in that passage is saying to us that we hear the shepherd's voice. We recognize his voice. And just as it was in the ancient days with the sheep, when they heard the shepherd call from the door of the sheepfold, his flock would come and they would follow him. God is calling to all of us through his word to get us to do and to follow him. If you think about God's Word, understand that His Word is truly the Word of truth. If you go to Psalm 119, and I wish tonight I had time to go and examine that whole passage, but you understand that I don't have time to go to the whole passage. But specifically when you go down to verse 105 of that passage, 
Notice the psalmist. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How many of us can understand if we are out in the dark, what helps guide us along the way? Think back when you were a lot younger, and maybe you still do this. I, I would, and I don't know for sure, but we have at least one individual in this auditorium that normally in his shirt pocket has one of these little devices. It's called a flashlight. What well, if you want to see where you're going and it's dark, you turn the flashlight on, don't you? Brethren, God's Word is the flashlight that we can turn on to lead us down the path of life. I'm reminded of a good friend of mine back when I began to preach in, in Kentucky. After we graduated, after I graduated, well, okay, not graduated, so we graduated. We moved back to Kentucky and I began to preach every other Sunday at a little congregation and there were 12 people there. Brother Fred Pence, every time he would pray, his prayer was to thank, he thanked God for the Bible. The book that led us from the earthly land to the glory. <coughs> the flashlight will lead us from the land of sin and of sorrow to the land of joy and peace. Jesus sums it up in John chapter 17, verse 17, doesn't he? As he's praying the prayer of unity. Remember? He begins by praying for the unity of he and the Father. And then he prays for the unity of he and the apostles. And then he prays for the unity of he and his church. In chapter 17 and verse 17, he says, Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. When we want to be led in the paths of righteousness, we will be led by the truth of God's Word. But then you go on in the 23rd Psalm, and notice he says, for his name's sake. Brethren, understand that our guidance by God through his Word, for his name's sake, defines our very purpose for existing on the earth. And when I think about our purpose, I can't help but to think of Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 10, where it says that we were created to be His workmanship. In other words, we were created to do the work of the Lord. That's challenging for us. And I understand in the spiritual sense that for us to be a worker for the Lord is to do the work that needs to be done within the kingdom. What is the true responsibility and the true work of the church? Do we know what it is? Jesus tells us, right as he's getting ready to ascend into heaven in Matthew chapter 28, does he not? What does he say our role is to be? He says that we are to go into all the world to teach all nations, make disciples of those folks, that we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What is our role? Our role is very simple. It is to lead the lost to the Lord. That's our role. That's our workmanship. That's our purpose for being on the earth. Our purpose, and God doesn't need anything else. He wants us to be loyal and faithful to Him and to bring people to Him. That is our purpose. How are we to do that? How are we to accomplish His purpose? Go back and read Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Where we are told not to be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed. What does that mean? What, is that, what, is, what does it mean not to be conformed, but to be transformed? It means that we as God's children cannot live like those who are outside of the church, those who are in the world. Conformity means we're going to live like the world. 
Being transformed means we're changed, we're different. I, I believe there are other passages that I could have went to. But remember, we are to be a peculiar people. Don't think of anything bad about that word. It just means that you're different. We're to, we're to be that royal priesthood. We're to be that chosen people. That's what God wants us to be. And when we are transformed, not conformed, we will be able to present our bodies, as Paul says, as a living sacrifice. Because that's what he wants. You see, under the Old Testament, remember, the sacrifices that the children of Israel would offer were very important, right? They had sacrifices for, well, fill in the blank. They had so many I can't remember all of them. But you and I, as we live today, we only have one sacrifice to offer. And that is to give our total being, our total purpose to the work that God has created us to do. That's purpose. That's what he means for his namesake. We are to use his word to accomplish his will. And when we do that, heaven will be our home after a while. But as you continue on in the psalm, in the 23rd psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we're going to be tested. It's a testing. And when you think about this testing, I want to call your attention to probably, I, I think I can say this with certainty. Probably my most favorite passage of Scripture. Maybe even more favorite than the 23rd Psalm. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. When it speaks about the temptations. Rather, the testing comes because it is, the first part of verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10 says, that it is common to all men. There is no one who has lived who is living, and who will ever live, that their faith will not be tested. As a matter of fact, James brings it out to us in James chapter 1, verse 2 and verse 3. A very strange verse where he says, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. What's joyful about dealing with a life-threatening sickness? Watch. Can you find, how do you find joy in that? Brother James, I don't want, I don't want you to cry tonight. But when I read James 1, 2, and 3, my, my outlook on that passage is totally different because of Sister Dot. Totally different. Because she lived and she understood that the trials that she was going through in this life they didn't amount to anything. Why? Because there was something better waiting for her. There was something better. How I hope that all of us, I hope that all of us can think of life might throw curves, life might give you lemons, whatever old cliche you want to throw out there. But I hope we'll remember Dot Edelman philosophy. There's something better waiting for me. There's something better. And I use her as my example. There are many others that I could call forth. But brethren, we're all going to be tested. And we ought to be joyful in our testing. David, as he writes this passage, is being tested. He's going through the very trial of life. And I know that it can be true. And turn back with me because I want to read this passage. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And read verse 54 down through verse 57. Why can I be tested? Number one, it's common. Number two... It's joyful because it causes our faith to grow. But look what Paul says. 
1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 54. He says, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall, be, shall it be brought to pass the same. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, the loving shepherd. Yes, I added the loving shepherd. But our victory over the trials of life is because we have a shepherd who will lead us in the paths of righteousness. Going back to the 23rd Psalm. I will fear no evil. Protection. Again, if you have your Bible, you can go back and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 again. And look at verse 13. We've already established temptation is common to all, right? What's the second part of the verse say? But with every temptation, he will what? Right. Make a way of escape. Someone says, where was God when? And you fill in the blank. Where was God when this was going on in my life or when that was going on in my life? Where was God? He deserted me. No. God was there with you. When it comes to temptation, when you succumb, remember, God has given you a way to escape. Because the God who you think is not there, He's in the exact same spot that He was when Jesus died on the cross. He promises, I will what? Never leave you nor forsake you. God is there. We just have to see through the fog or the haze and we have to see ways for us to escape from our temptation. He's there to protect us so that we will fear no evil. Or maybe we need to go over to 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at verse 8 and verse 9. I'm sure most of us know this passage. Be sober, vigilant, be on the lookout, I might say, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same offerings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Why are we told to be vigilant? Why? And, and very simply, what we're being told in the book of Peter is always be alert to your surroundings. Be aware of what's going on around you because when you let your guard down, Satan's going to come in. Now think about this. What Less his weakness is, is different than my weakness. Do you think Satan knows that? Do you think Satan knows where to hit you with the fiery darts that he's throwing? Does he know what fiery darts it will take to cause you to fall when it might take something totally different for, for me to fall or for someone else to fall? You see, that's why that we need to be sober, we need to be vigilant. And I hope you saw what it says there. Resist him. How do you resist him? By staying steadfast in the faith. How do you stay steadfast in the faith? Because you look to the light of righteousness. You let the light, the lamp of God, you let it guide and direct your steps. And you'll be a whole lot better off than trying to fight the battle by yourself. But look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, But may the God of all grace, 
who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle. What's the whole purpose of the testing that we're going to go through? Brother, remember, I hope you remember one of my, one of my favorite sayings. And it's only a matter of changing one letter and one word. Trials and temptations. They will either make you a better person or they will make you a bigger person. You know whose choice it is? Yours. Because God has made the way you escape. So the choice becomes yours. How you're going to react. God's always there to protect. Alright, let's go back over to the 23rd Psalm. He says, for you are with me. When you think about the fact that God is with you, brother, that's faithfulness. That is our God being faithful to His words. I go back to Hebrews chapter 13, and I look at verse 5 and verse 6. The Hebrew writer says, Let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For He Himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man can do to me. God is always with us. He's faithful. And then if you go back over to 1 Peter chapter 5, and you look at verse 6 and verse 7, do you remember what it says? Casting on Him all your cares. Why? Because He cares for you. Someone says, Brother Ray, how do I cast my cares on the Lord? Four letters. First letter's to P. The last word's a Y. And in the middle there is an R and an A. How do you give your cares to the Lord? If you do the best you can, and when you struggle with an answer, fall to your knees and pray. Pray. Now let me ask a question. Let me ask a silly question. If you want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand. If you don't, then you don't have to. How many of you believe in the power of prayer? Keep your hands up. Question number two. How many, of, how many of you have seen the power of prayer? See? Next question. Why don't we utilize prayer more often in the difficult times of life? Why don't we use prayer so that we'll know God is faithful? He's always there. You know, long before the internet, long before the internet, I don't know who did the sign this week. Did you read it yet? Anybody read the sign? God sent a text message. Get it? Have you read it? And long before that I could type out a, 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 a document and hit a little button down in the corner that says send, and I could talk to someone all the way over in the Philippines, do you realize there was a direct line to the Father? You would call it me. God's always there. Someone says, well, wait a minute. What do you mean God's always there? He let his son go to the cross. Do you remember that? Do 
Do you remember that prayer in the garden? Did Jesus pray? Oh, wait a minute. Jesus pray? J Jesus pray? In the garden, as he's out there praying, what was his prayer? Did he not pray to the Father if there was any other way? Let this cup pass from me. But what did he end up saying? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Was God faithful to his son? Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father, and the Father was faithful to him. How do I know he was faithful? I can sum it up real quickly. I know God was faithful to him. Because early in the morning, on a Sunday, yeah, right? Early on a Sunday morning, you, you remember? They were going to the tomb where he had been buried to anoint his body with incense. And as they approached, remember the angel of the Lord? Why seek the living? with the dead. Was God faithful to the Son? If God was faithful to the Son who submitted His will to the will of the Father and the Father was faithful and brought Him back to life resurrected Him. Brother, we serve a living God. We serve a risen Savior. By the way, we had visitors last week who only come once or twice a year. Have you ever asked them the question, why do you only come then? Jesus is still, a, is, is still risen. He's still living, not just that one Sunday. But he's living and risen every Sunday of the year. God is faithful because we see the evidence of his faithfulness in his son who gave his life for us. I to make sure I cover all these points. All right, we want to cover one more. Back over to the 23rd Psalm. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Here's really the direct allusion to the tools of the shepherd. And very simply, what this is, is discipline. What was the tool that a shepherd used? <coughs> it was sharp on one end and it had a large crook on the other end. His staff, his rod, most of the time they were built together. The end with the point was used to fight off the savage beast. The crook of the, of the, of the shepherd's hook was used to rescue one who had gone astray. And remember in the mountains, in the, in the days and in the time when David is writing this, the mountainous regions where the shepherds dwelt. There were all kinds of places that were full of dangers. There were all kinds of places for the trials and the temptations that we face. And the shepherd would lower that crook, that hook, if a sheep had fallen into a cavern, he would reach down and he would gently hook them and pull them back to safety. God uses His Word to discipline us for the explicit point of keeping us safe. To keep us faithful to His Word. 
Go back over to Hebrews and look in chapter 12. And look at verse 6. Maybe, maybe you know this verse by memory. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens. Other translations translate the word chastens. He disciplines. And scourges every son whom He receives. How does He do that? How does He discipline us? Remember? Thy word is a what? <coughs> Light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. Is that right? No. Maybe got it backwards. I've been known to do that today, occasionally. But I want you to think about it. But I want to remind you tonight as we bring this thought to a close. I want to take you back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16, verse 7. Shouldn't have to look at it, should you? All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for. Right? Profitable for. First one says what? Reproof. Right? Correction. Instruction in righteousness sake. Brethren, the definition of God's discipline is given in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. He tells us the word comes from him, it is spoken by him, and it is for our benefit to lead us to do what is right in God's sight. That's discipline. For those of you who don't know, our granddaughter was here this weekend. She had done well. <clears throat> She's just a little puppy. Accidents will happen, right? She had a minor accident this afternoon. And John Ross took the red box case and he popped her in the head. That was mean. That was cruel. He shouldn't have ever done that, should he? I know some of you dog lovers said so that wouldn't be very nice. Why did he pop the dog on the head? He's trying to instruct the dog that what you did in the house is a no-no. Brethren, God uses His Word. And when we dig deep into His Word and we come to an understanding of His Word, it's not to knock us in the head just to be knocking us in the head. It is knocking us in the head to get us to understand that we must live by His Word if we're going to inherit eternal life. That's discipline. So as you think tonight, as you think about what we've looked at today in the 23rd Psalm, I hope I've caused you to stop, to think, and to truly begin to understand who the shepherd is and what he wants and expects and will do for you. Tonight do we have one in our midst who's not a member of the body of Christ? And you need to know the shepherd. And the only way that you can truly know the shepherd is to become part of the flock. And in order to become part of the flock, you've got to obey what God's Word says. And His Word says that you must leave the way of sin and of sorrow. And you must turn, repent, and begin to live the way God wants you to live. You need to begin the process of transformation. And as you begin that process, are you willing to explicitly state that Jesus is the Son of the living God? Confession. Oh, and by the way, that confession is not a one-time thing because the process of transformation requires that you make that confession every day you live after you become a Christian. We be immersed, baptized, to have your sins washed away. Or tonight we have one who has done that. And you've allowed your life to go back into the way of the world. 
You've left the shepherd. You've forgotten what the shepherd has in store for you. You can come home tonight with that penitent heart, a desire to confess the public sins that you might have. Let your brethren help you. Let us use the prayer and let us encourage you that we might all live in eternity one day. If you have a need tonight, our prayer is very simple. Come to the front, make your need known while we stand and while we sing.